Now to ABC's Bob Woodruff on the scene in Kuala Lumpur, where families of the missing passengers are at a boiling point right now. Protests erupting at a press conference this morning. So much emotion. And Bob joins us with the latest from there. Good morning, Bob. Good morning, Robin. Yeah, this has been a real moment of insanity. We've been having these, these news conferences every single day. The government's come out to tell everything they know about Flight 370. The family members, though, have been getting very angry because they're not getting enough information. Well, today, they just poured in there and vented. It was a sudden, unexpected protest. Chinese family members unfolded a banner accusing the Malaysian government of hiding the truth and delaying the search. The police then quickly whisked them out, and then it turned to chaos. It has been almost two weeks since the Boeing 777 went missing. And with so few answers, theories have swirled. The latest, residents on a remote island in the Maldives say they saw a low-flying jumbo jet at around 6.15 a.m. local time the day the plane disappeared. But this morning, the Minister of Transport said that's not true. Regarding reports that the plane was sighted in the Maldives, I can confirm that the Malaysian chief of the Defence Force has contacted his counterpart in the Maldives, who has confirmed that these reports are not true. Meanwhile, our ABC's own Gloria Riviera retraced Flight 370 from Kuala Lumpur, taking the red eye to Beijing, just like 239 passengers and crew did that fateful night. Soon after takeoff, just before 370 communications started to fail, the crew would have been starting food service, the passengers, like us, getting settled. In less than an hour, something on 370 was seriously wrong. We're over 40 minutes into the flight. By this time on flight 370, someone had switched off transponder communication with air traffic control. So the plane was really no longer in contact, direct contact with anyone on the ground. And this is also the point at which the plane made a turn to the west. Would passengers notice they're in the middle of dinner and they're also getting ready for bed? But on this flight, nothing unusual except on landing when the pilot said, Have a blessed morning. And now we're just starting to get a little bit more information about where the family went. The last I saw them, they're going up the escalator. Exactly where they're going to go from here is still unclear, but we're finding out more as we go along. Robin and George. Boy, right. a lot of pain there this morning. Let's get some uh, digging into this new information now with David Curley and ABC's aviation consultant Steve Gaynor. And Steve, let me begin with you. This flight simulator information could be significant. We've also learned from Malaysian authorities that the files were deleted on February 3rd. If they are found, what could they tell us? Georgia, it's like most, uh, it's most, most piece of evidence in this, in this mystery. We just don't know. If there's a reason for him to have erased it, uh, there's certainly forensics that can be done. Most police departments, most intelligence agencies can go back and look at what was erased on that hard drive. So we should find out in due course. And, and David, as you pointed out, some confusion on the part of Malaysian authorities now on whether or not this plane was pre-programmed, the turn was pre-programmed. Go through our best reporting on that right now. We know that U.S officials were briefed that it was programmed ahead of time to make that turn. But there are a lot of experts that are pushing back, including pilots of the 777 saying, you know, just because you program it doesn't mean that it transmits the data. So we don't know how these, the U.S. investigators actually know this. They continue to say that they believe the turn was programmed. And of course, this is so significant because if it were pre-programmed, that really points you in the direction of deliberate action. It starts to say, because if you did that and then you had the radio call where you said, all right, good night, uh, it does say something happened before everything started to be turned down, turned off. But don't forget, one more piece of information could change this whole thing. Well, and that's what I want to bring back to Steve Gaynor, because there are two big competing theories right now, Steve, on what could have happened. A deliberate act, a kind of hijacking, either by the pilots or under duress, or some kind of a catastrophic failure. That's one of the big questions out there right now. Analyze those two theories. I think the catastrophic failure, there are lots of ideas out there. There are mishaps that we've seen in the past that we can point to. Some folks are talking about a fire on board. Uh, to me, I just don't see how the airplane continued to fly for seven and a half hours if there was a fire on board. Once fires get started on airplanes, they continue and they don't, they don't let up. You know, look at the Swiss Air flight, the Value Jet, Asiana, UPS, all these were in-flight fires that ended very, very quickly and badly. On the hijacking side, well, we, we, we see all these premeditated actions, so right now I think we favor that theory that human beings were involved in the disappearance of this aircraft. And David Curley, of course, the other big question raised by the size of the search area 
right now. The clock ticking down on those batteries. Will this plane ever be found? Actually, experts say they do think it's going to be found. Will it be found in the time the batteries run out? We don't know. Air France was found long after the black boxes stopped pinging. Um, I, I kind of believe these experts that at some point we're going to find this aircraft, and we do have that concentrated area off Australia they're looking. Steve, you agree with that? I, I'm a little more pessimistic than David is. I think that the search area is just, uh, it, it's, a, it's almost a practical impossibility in some of the deepest water, the roughest waters in the world. Uh, I sure hope so, but, but uh, things are looking really bleak at this point. Okay, Steve Gaynor, David Curley, thanks very much.